back in June when silver was around $18, you had a $32 forecast. Silver made it up to $29. So given that, if you can tell folks what happened there and also what you see coming next. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics on a darn exciting week of life here, uh, not just in the U.S., but all around the globe. And it's nice that I have uh, John Lee of Silver Elephant joining me from the Far East to talk some silver. Um, John, if you have any insight into the election, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe by the time this is aired, we'll, we'll have a winner. Uh, <laughs> only in the U.S. <laughs> Here we go. Now, now we can't even tell who wins the darn thing. But interesting to see Silver's reaction this week was, I mean, on election night, it you know just fell off a cliff in a matter of seconds. Uh, I wonder if the CFTC ch checked that or they're just home sleeping. Uh, but then a rally after that. Anyway, I know people are exciting, wondering what's going on, and it's great to have you here. So. Welcome on in, my friend. It's wonderful to see you again. Yeah, Chris, we live in interesting times. And this uh, election is not just a U.S. event. It's a global phenomenon. I am uh, from, I'm living in Taiwan right now, as you know, but uh, I was just eating the, picked up my daughter from school and uh, having a little bit of uh, food in the local food stall. And you see a little 14-inch black and white television. And guess what? They're watching analysis of the U.S. election. <laughs> It's, it's incredible. Uh, <clears throat> if only, uh, I mean, gee, if I could pass along something, I wish people around the globe were watching the Federal Reserve's policy because, I don't know, I guess the election, uh, I, don't, I personally don't know how much the guy that we call president really decides anything. We'll leave that no. aside. But I mean, it's the Federal Reserve, uh, I think, is what brings so many of us to silver because... I mean, you can study what they've done for the last hundred years. You can study the last couple thousand years of central banking history. Um, you know, eight million reasons to Sunday of why the Fed cannot raise interest rates. They can't undo this. We got a glimpse of that in 2018. And I mean, now we're with Corona. I mean, we're, you know, all right, there's another three trillion supposedly from the bailout, which means it was probably... I don't know. I'd bet an ounce of silver if they say three trillion is probably closer to five or ten. Um, go ahead, please. And you know, <laughs> yeah, Chris. Uh, um, there's a lot of well. I think first of all, I don't think the election would be called within the next day, within the next day or two. Is more like probably by the end of the year if we're lucky, because you have a, a number of very closely contested states in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, in in Arizona. And um, I think President Trump has already filed lawsuits. And when you have these mail-in ballots, which is um, probably not tried out in the rest of the world, um, it's, it's open for uh, you opening a can of worms. Um, secondly, about, um, about the Fed, I have, to, I have to say, Chris, there's a lot of talk about the dollar rebound, right? Is that everybody, including the grandmothers, is bearish of the dollar, so the dollar has to rebound. And some say 95, 96, 97. I've been telling you, we've been talking a while now, I, I thought that this time around, it's not going to be as rebound, it's not going to be the same extent as it was after the financial, 2011 financial cri 2009 financial crisis. Biggest reason, exactly like you said about the Fed, is um, Greenspan, I thought, was mastery at uh, playing the elusives. So he is very good at talking a lot about nothing. And that's exactly the purpose of the Fed chairman, because you cannot go up there and say, we're going to print infinity. You, cannot, you have to keep the market guessing, because the end game is, is in Zimbabwe dollar. Okay, that is an end game. But the key here is to keep us, is to pass the buck, right? Keep the musical chair going. So you want to keep it as long as you can. And, and so that's why, you know, during the, remember Greenspan era, they were talking about deflationary concerns, right? And the, uh, and the uh, Clinton era was talking about, we want a strong dollar, strong dollar policy. So it's talking about, so keep the market guessing to try to elongate the, the, the longevity of the dollar. However, Chris, um, 
Trump is not as and Trump and, and Jay Powell they're a bit green in in in, in running monetary policy and running the government. So now you have you have Jay Powell that basically come out and said that they're going to keep the interest rate at zero until 2022. That's something that Greenspan hey, would never John, say. John, John, keep, yes. keep in mind, uh, I think at the last Fed meeting, that's now 2023. Um, that's just I, foolish I, to say. My, my Arcadia forecast target is till the end of eternity. But even Powell has... He backed it off a year when things weren't going well. Now he's begging for more stimulus. So maybe that'll be 2030 by the next meeting. Yeah. And then, Chris, on the other side, you know, it used to be the case, right? At least the politicians would pretend, okay, we're going to balance the budget. Like if you're 2018, so I'm going to balance the budget in, 20, in 2011 or 2012. So that people have the perception that the tightening on, on the physical policy or monetary policies are just around the corner. So to keep the guys honest. But now you have Donald Trump that say, you know what, you go big or, or you go home. <laughs> and they and, did. Uh, <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, two trillion is not enough, two, 3.5. And so you're running at the rate of a trillion dollars a month. And, and Chris, the state of the economy right now with shutdowns, uh, you know, in Europe and elsewhere, this two or three trillion dollars good till April, and and then what? And so um, I just thought that, and and this combination of factors, and and now the dollar is going to the root of Japanese yen. It's it's the it's the carry trade of choice, just like the yen, right? They're going to say to keep the interest rate perma zero. And, um, and the, the, the dollar is embarking on the same faith. So, and that's why yen was in a perpetual bear market because it's the risk-free currency. You're basically borrowing something for free of which you can go and do a bunch of things that you want, you know, name one, right? Real estate, buy ours, collectibles, uh, whatever it is. So, and um, I think the dollar is done. Uh, there may be a debt cap bounce further, but I've been t uh, talked to you before. That, that I'll be very surprised if it stays long or uh, way above 50-day moving average. Now it's below that. And, um, and I think we're on the way to testing 88, uh, as, as, as I have been saying. Um, this, and then the point real quick to, 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 to just to reference is, Chris, this, the dollar died. This is uh, despite of the uncertainties that are still surrounding the election. So I was quite was I was quite surprised of the veracity of 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 how the equity market rebounded and how the dollar uh, dived and that just showed that there is a lot of pent up and and exactly like you said about earlier about the commercial looking at the silver market well two days leading up to the election you can literally watch silver is like watching the paint dry right there's no volume to speak of so now the cards are shown. That there's uh, that there's a lot of pent up on the metals as well as its equity for that matter, and they're just waiting for that um, election as as the as, a, as the catalyst or as the entry point, regardless of outcome. And uh, you know, I was thinking, well, if, if it's uncertain or if Biden wins, then you might have a correction, and that that was not the case. So, however, having said all that, Chris, uh, I. I don't think maybe some participants are still not aware that the election could drag out for a while. And that might mean the stimulus might not pass this year. So we might get a temporary correction. I don't know the severity, but I'll be very surprised if it goes back to where we started yesterday. So um, I would just say now it presents actually a very, very good entry point for, uh, for the medals, Chris. Yeah, although I'll disagree with you on one part there, John, if I may. Yes, I will I will bet you an ounce of, of silver that there is stimulus this year. I don't think the Fed's going to wait for the president to come in. It's like, hey, we don't have time for this. Uh, I mean, there's going to, I don't know, maybe, would, maybe they'll finally go to nominative negative, nom nominal negative interest rates. I mean, we already have real interest rates negative, uh, but... I would imagine, uh, regardless of the election, they'll print up something else this year. All of which is a big part of what brings so many people to silver. Again, uh, I don't know, I talk a lot about my feelings on silver and I do, I don't know, take <laughs> money I earn and buy silver stocks and silver and you know, I guess I'll see how long I have to wait yet. Perhaps even more than 
confidence in silver. I mean, maybe my real confidence is that these guys are never going to stop printing money. And uh, anyway, it's interesting. I'd love to get your thoughts on what we see here. So the blue line is the third. That's Tuesday election night. And we see yes. this floating around 24 bucks or so. And then just drops off a cliff here, rebounds um, now as uh, we're recording on Thursday. So I'll bet at least uh, time of recording, there's some people smiling to see up uh, almost 5% over a dollar. Um, what do you think about all of that? Um, uh, Chris, I, I think that silver, as we know, as we talked about it before, there there are certain um, actors in the market that are not exactly profit driven. There are other ulterior motives. So when you, whenever you have a thin market, it's always open and prone to uh, commercial come in. So at any given point in time, for somebody who's been in the silver market for you and as long as you and I have commercials can just uh, pickpocket you and, uh, you know, flash a 5,000 sales contract at the thinnest market volume possible to try to induce selling for the purpose of covering the position or establishing a position. So um, I wouldn't read too much into, um, into the, uh, I wouldn't read too much into sort of these uh, temporary spike down. Um, however, um, I, I was very encouraged and again, a bit surprised to see uh, how fierce the rebound of the silver and equity were, given that there's still uncertainties in the election outcome and we don't even know which president is gonna be elected. Um, and um, and, and um, so I think the volume, combination of volume and, um, and, the, uh, and that there's certainty of climbing the wall of worry is a very positive sign. And what we need to see, Chris, is we're gonna to continue to see volatilities in the next three to five days. However, if we see today's gain were to uh, carry over to say a Monday or Tuesday next week, then um, if silver, as I said, trade above $25 by, by Tuesday, um, surviving say the potential Friday correction, then uh, you're looking at a genuine um, next phase of the bull market that could carry silver to at least $32 by the end of the year. Well, and we'll get back to that, although just because you mentioned it, uh, here we have the chart of silver. Here's that uh, dip on election night. And John, I say this, my background uh, as an equity options trader, um, we're specifically trained not when a market is thin to hammer out a position, because if you're selling something and you crash the market, you're getting a lower price and you want to maximize the price that you sell at. Um, so I've always found this odd. Uh, I say that I'm fortunate to be in this position where I get to speak from some of the world's best investors. Uh, they've found it odd. Is this an example of what you're talking about where you see this massive spike in volume? Uh, we see this regularly and here the price just gets hammered almost uh, over a dollar in uh, seems like a short period of time. Well, I think the number two, I, uh, Chris, I don't track the market sort of by the hour, but uh, you're look, that may be the Hong Kong Open. Usually uh, you have the uh, events that transpired. I see November the 3rd, that's a Tuesday. So you have events that transpired up to uh, the market, like basically the guys wake up in Hong Kong digesting what has happened the day before. So that, that is a sign somebody capitulated. Um, we talked about it prior to the show it's very similar to what I saw in, in March, right? When, when silver went down to 11, $12, um, uh, or 13, whatever that was, <laughs> so this long time ago, that created that panic bottom with heavy volume. And so I think in this, in this particular circumstance, it just seemed like somebody capitulated. And, uh, and then it was subsequently met with buying with heavy volume and a, a big fierce rebound. So those are all very good signs of a definitive bottom. A definitive bottom. Um, I, I said one more time, if, if we're to survive uh, through next Tuesday above $25, then we are looking at um, you know, a next major run up. Yeah, well, that's one thing I'd like to dig into. And just as a recap, John, I believe back in June when silver was around $18, you had a $32 forecast. Silver made it up to $29. So given that, if you can tell folks what happened there and also what you see coming next. 
Yeah, well, Chris, um, silver, I don't have to try in front of you, but I, I think, you know, silver peaked at $50 in 2011. And since then, uh, from 2013 to 2017, 18, it's been six years in the bear market, oscillating between uh, $13 and 20. So in, 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 um, in Canada Day, uh, given, I think then what happened is subsequent to uh, the March um, uh, COVID crisis, um, there was, it, it just seemed like the stars aligned both technically and fundamental and fundamentally. On, on the fundamental side, just the pace of, uh, yes, you saw there. So there you see July, it was inching towards passing $18. Um, and it was a uh, it was a, a six year uh, it was a six year consolidation. So typically, once you once you cross a six year consolidation of a twenty dollar resistance level, um, it is um, um, you know uh, the uh, the breakout usually is emphatic, and you're looking at a major run up. And uh, fundamentally, I was just uh, looking at how quickly the Fed had uh, responded to the crisis. And also the uh, and how how quickly the the government had printed, so everything we're living sort of in an accelerated when accelerated <laughs> a time as as opposed to two thousand and nine during the Obama era where everything took a little time to materialize. So I mean, given all those factors in place, the six year consolidation and just the speed of which the the Fed and the government were uh, count counterbalancing the effect of COVID. And that, and then that, and that gold was uh, on the verge of breaking out of eighteen hundred dollars, and then just using a uh, just using a, a combination of the technical factors, the fundamental factors. Factors. Um, I put an article out still on Seeking Alpha. Uh, you could just Google John Lee Seeking Alpha Silver that uh, uh, and uh, attach a target of thirty two dollars by the end of the year. John, you mentioned a few interesting things here pulled up the Fed's balance sheet, which you can see, I mean, even it's interesting, here's back in 2011. Yes. <laughs> this is August of 2011, when silver's at 50 bucks. I mean, it never really slowed down. <laughs> here's the end of 2018, they try and undo it a little bit. Um, and obviously it spikes there. So I guess what's, what's, Stunning in its own right is that it's like even where things stand now, it's almost it, do, it doesn't even matter what happened because it's like given where we stand today, it's like no matter what happens going forward, the Fed has basically said no matter what market goes up, market goes down, we're, we're gonna print. It's it's stunning. We're actually it seems like we're you said before that it's like their plan is the Zimbabwe dollar and. I think what people have been wondering for decades even seems to be uh, on the way. Actually, I got right here the silver deliveries on the COMEX where we've seen some records this year. Here's 17,294 in July, another 11,000 in September. We got December coming up. Um, any thoughts on what we've seen with the COMEX deliveries and how you interpret this data, John? Well, uh, Chris, I usually don't get too much into the data points because everybody sees it. So whenever it's published, it's already being factored into the market. Um, obviously, the uh, the more server delivery you get from the, the COMEX um, is, is a very encouraging sign. However, inventory levels uh, has actually never been a good indicator of, 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 uh, of uh, the price trends. Base metals, for example, it doesn't mean if you have warehouse um, inventory doesn't mean, doesn't actually predict the price trends. But Chris, I want to go back to your point about fast printing. Now, let me share a couple of insights with you. Um, if, I mean, central banks print, every single central bank prints. Um, it's not so much the printing that's causing the silver prices to go up, but it's the pace of which they're printing and the, the adjustment that the public um, are, are not accustomed to looking at it. So for example, if you look at Brazil or Turkey or um, some other developing countries, um, they're used to say 10% or 15% inflation or Colombia, for example, and then life goes on as usual. You don't see like a bank run, right? You don't see people waving flags or running crazy or taking a hole into a shelter. So this time run is different because as I said, because the pace of which they're going at it. Uh, 
I mean, even if you look at uh, if you look at 2009, the Fed printed four trillion dollars. Gold responded to to 11, 1800, back down to 1100, because they thought it was a one-off event. Uh, and this time around, I think first of all on the QE side, they're printing so quickly, such large amounts. Um, it's like an ant. I don't know if you do this micro sort of uh, with the magnifying glass playing with the ant, right? The end doesn't burn until it reaches a certain point. Like it survives. So, so long as the temperature goes steadily, everything seems quite normal. And then you got this spontaneous combustion. It will happen eventually, Chris. So, what the Fed is doing now is just um, accelerated to the inevitable. And because the pace of which printing, it's not because it's printing, every day is printing, but it's printing so quickly. And the other thing, Chris, I would just counter to your thoughts about the Fed's printing. As I said, it's not actually the printing that makes a difference um, because uh, like uh, James Turk has already done the, the study of silver price and gold price versus N3 and whatnot. There's a, again, not a direct correlation um, is, is that I think the stimulus, uh, the physical stimulus actually does more for silver prices than say QE because QE is, is it's a known sort of, it's, it's out there, right? It's been done before. All the countries have been doing it. Japan has been doing QE for God, for how long already, right? And it's the second largest economy. So by your logic, silver should have gone up, you know, a lot higher already. Um, it's actually the feds, it's, it's actually the government running these huge deficits are handing out money to ordinary people and, and we're just bailing out companies left and right, giving out small business loans. It rose the confidence. It's called the fear factor. James Turk talked of the fear factor. It's eroding the confidence of the dollar. I think that actually has a lot more to do with, uh, with the silver price. Another example is Ponzi schemes, right? So eventually it takes a, a certain catalyst. And I'm just saying that in my view, um, in my view, it's, it's, it's not so much the printing that, that was causing the price to go up, but, but it's just the confidence, the erosion of the confidence. Um, you have a set of beliefs and that beliefs were, uh, turned out to be false. I mean, another quick example, for example, Chris, you know, like Donald Trump, right? He spent months and weeks and year to, uh, negotiating with China and uh, got something like $50 billion worth of concessions from China. Well, the Fed just printed $3 trillion. So everybody's like, why bother anymore, right? So I think, I think, just, the, I think just the whole thing, had, everybody started thinking, well, wh why would I want to keep the dollar it's, it's like, it's, it's not precious anymore. It's not a store of value. It's never been a good store of value, but th these set of events really just hasten the, the idea. People have having second thought about it. I think the oldest combination was, I think more the physical printing, uh, the physical government handout is actually more detriment to the fiat than, 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 uh, than the FESQ. Those, those are my thoughts. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I appreciate you bringing that up because it's something I've been thinking about where, you know, if we sit here and say, well, they printed this much money, so that's where gold and silver should be. Well, when you have a COMEX trading futures, it ain't going to work that way, as we've all learned. Yet, um, I think you're right. What is the catalyst? What does it come down to? And perhaps uh, there couldn't be a better catalyst than it just is so silly. It's become so oppressive that it's like people are realizing, hey, what they're telling us doesn't make sense. I, I keep thinking about how, I don't know, I kept getting these Wall Street Journal alerts that Joe Biden's up by 12 points. And now here it is, the thing's so close, they can't even tell who won. So maybe, uh, fortunately, I remember that from lat four years ago. So I was ready this time. And I'm glad, uh, I feel honored to have the show. And I'll say everyone at home, Four years from now, whatever they say leading up to it, like, don't let it affect your day. Don't, like, get upset or, you know, uh, I mean, so much of it's nonsense yet at the end of the day. I mean, I think people aren't, they're, they're like, all right, you know, you know, these guys lied. They turned out there weren't weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, Bernanke told us it was temporary. Powell's saying, well, we can't undo the stimulus now because it's weak. But I'm like, wait, you said... Last 10 years, it was great. You didn't undo anything then. They didn't talk about it. I haven't found, and I'll, uh, I haven't found anyone who heard during any point in the campaign, anybody saying anything about the debt, anybody commenting on the Fed. And No. You know, 
I'm sure there's other stuff that these guys have to do or whatever, well, I, but and you know what? It's gonna go home to roost. Uh, it's gonna go home to roost. Uh, and um, of course, as I said, you know, Jay Jay Powell. There's a. I mean, it's always a, You know, we talked about it before, right? When you're buying and selling, how do you know? What do you know more than somebody sell than than the seller? That's how you make money, right? You disagree on the future, but you agree on the price. So who's the right about the future? So you're always gonna say, well, if, 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 if silver is such a good catch, so it's good, good value, what is the catch? And um, so other than that, people are still holding on this belief that tomorrow things are gonna solve itself. Um, but then I think just gonna be constantly pounded every three months with these uh, trillions of dollars of printing. Um, and, and I think there's a, another camp of thoughts, of course, a lot of people don't talk about is the dollar is still the, the uh, premier store of value for X um, US savers. So like my mom, for example, um, for a lot of the Asian investors, um, every, I mean, they still hold dollar as dear. And uh, so they were a bit caught up blindsided by the weakness of the dollar. However, um, they're not, I, I think they're gonna think twice before buying more dollars, because as I said again, right, it's all out, the cats are out in the open. Um, and secondly, Chris, is, is, is um, there's not other alternative um, form of currencies to hold uh, to compete with silver and gold. Uh, another example, again, because I live in Asia, every time you go to the bank, you have, you have the current, you have the uh, exchange rates, gold and silver, and you have interest rates next to them. So a lot of grandpas and grandmas, unfortunately, it's a bit of, it's, it's, it's cruel, right? You have the savers are not getting any, easy, easy. I mean, they don't, they don't want to speculate. They just want to, they just want a re modest return on their retirement, but they don't have that. So it used to be the case you have, you know, you, you borrow the dollar, you go 6% Australia, or you go 8% uh, New Zealand, or you go 10% uh, South African. You can go Israeli, you, like, you know, I have that table of interest rates. Now you, you can pull up the chart, it's all zeros, right? So you stare at it, okay, it's all zeros, and where are you gonna go? And uh, now, like, guys can't even go to Thailand, for example, I have a place there because of COVID, you can't go to Australia, and the real estate is, is not good, uh, bonds are not good, uh, you don't know what to do. So I think, Chris, that, that camp of money, I think a lot of them are not, are not thinking about it and they're only thinking about gold and silver for the first time. And, and, and when you talk to these people, they're like, well, last time gold was 1800, you told me to get gold and, and go into 1100. It's a volatile, it's too risky, it's not for me. But I think that once gold definitively passed 2000, I think that would be a very clear sign to a lot of people that this time is truly, really very different, despite all the other signs are telling you, but now you have a technical indicator that's telling you confirmation of the fundamentals. And then if you attach, you know, last time round at the, at, the at the top of the silver market, you're looking at a, you're looking at a 30 to one gold to silver ratio, then at a, at, at, at a, um, a $3,000, 2000 $3,000 silver, then you're looking at corresponding, correspondingly a 70 to a $100 uh, silver price. Um, those are the things you think about. And uh, as I said, going back to my ant analogy or the water boiling, they don't, they, it's spontaneous. People have that thought and then the market would run, correct itself. So if gold takes out 2000, as I said last time in your show, it's going to go to 27 to $3,000 fairly quickly. And then silver is just going to catch on. Um, the last point on that is, Commodities every decade spend seven years going sideways, two years going down, and one year going up. If you miss that one year, you are you're you have to wait for another eight years. So as has been telling um, uh, all the people that listen to me, establish a position and uh, just hold on to it. Don't use too much leverage, and um, you know you can buy gold, silver, metals, or some shares for leverage. Uh, both forms are fine, and I have a I have quite a bit of physical silver. So uh, it's just you don't want to miss the right. You don't want to capture and be cute at that five to ten percent and sell, thinking that you can buy back a little bit cheaper. It's gonna the train's gonna leave, and it's not gonna it's not gonna come back. Well, John, I appreciate that. That makes a lot of sense to me. 
And especially during election season where, you know, just thinking about you have choices. You can vote for guy A or guy B. You can subscribe to participating in the American political system or not doing that. And similar to what I like to do with finance is that, you know, I bring these guests on and I, I thought, a, I think I agreed with everything you said. B, I thought it was well explained and logical so folks could choose to listen to you. Or the leader, former leader of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, who introduced quantitative easing. And when they asked him what he thought was happening in the mm -hmm. gold market, he responded with... But let me just end by saying that nobody really understands gold prices, and I don't uh, pretend to really understand them either. <laughs> wait, wait, my favorite part. To, to, all, to Congress, who's getting reelected right now. How did they respond? Were they outraged? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. No, they, all, me... they all giggle. <laughs> so anyway, John, in, uh, I appreciate you being on here and in terms of helping me opt out of the system. Um, before we wrap up, could you just let folks know it's interesting what you've done in response to this and uh, I may be seeing it in person soon myself, but if you could just mention that and let folks know a little bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, well, Chris, go back to Ben and Bernanke. They all full well aware of the role of gold and silver, but they kind of go out there and say, you know what, dollar's doomed, right? Go and buy some gold and silver. So you have, there's a lot of lip service that they're paying. And uh, and, um, says, and I think, go, yeah, it's just, I'm very surprised at what Jay Powell is, is actually telling people that the dollar is gonna stay. And, um, um, the new bond team um, said already, right? Sometimes the crowd, the public is gonna take some time to adapt to the new reality. I ju they just haven't done that yet. Now I'll go back to what I'm doing. Uh, Chris, is my full-time job is actually the, the chairman of a silver exploration company called Silver Elephant. We traded incredible liquidity. I think we traded like 100 million shares in the last two months. Um, the, the company just being rebranded as, uh, as we're coming out of the closet and showing our true colors as a silver bull. And uh, we are anticipating a mega run up in silver, uh, north of $50. And uh, we're looking at ways how we can profit from it. And Chris, the, the way we go about it is to accumulate, acquire um, silver in the ground. So our mandate is to enable our shareholders of Silver Elephant to own as much silver in the ground as possible. And Chris, you know what? Some silver may be more advanced, are proven and probable, high grade. We have those. And, but those are more expensive to acquire, right? And then there are some that are lower grade and there are maybe earlier stage and they have a much higher confidence level. Maybe the drill holes are more white space. So, but however, you know what? Those ounces are being valued cheaply right now. So Chris, our idea is to have a spectrum of silver projects, also provide a bit of risk diversification. But the, the whole idea is to get as much silver as we can. Um, and. Uh, for, for um, you know, the whole idea is buy low and sell high, right? So you want to buy, be buying things are, which nobody wants. Uh, it's no secret that silver is hot. So, well, the next thing you want to do is buy silver. There are maybe of a lower grade or there are maybe doesn't have as much confidence level in the amount of silver. But those things are going to worth a lot more money uh, as silver continues to run. And as the choices of of a silver investments uh, become more, uh, there that can be had for a good price become more and more limited. So our our uh, our goal is to uh, develop and, and uh, prove up 300 million ounces. We just announced a resource estimate two weeks ago. We're at 120, and we have two other projects. The rigs are turning. We should have drill results next week. It's good to be on the show. Good timing. Next week, and then uh, we're going down there to in Bolivia where our projects are. And we found something very, very interesting. It's a very huge land package. We have 112, 115 square kilometers, very pro prospective land, of which only 10% is being explored. So you, you are, for those who are interested in leveraging silver, speculative type of investors, I highly recommend you take a look um, at Silver Elephant. Well, I appreciate that, John. I'll have the contact page here with the relevant phone, email information, uh, and I appreciate, uh, it was just so different from my time on Wall Street where companies like you, uh, what I try to bring to investors, at least giving them access to the information, place to get their questions answered so you find out if it's right for you or not. Um, so anyway, John, I appreciate the silver talk. 
great to catch up with you. And uh, folks at home, if you would like to hear more about Silver Elephant, John has recorded a profile a couple weeks back, and that is coming your way now.